as gifts by the gift giver, Al-Wahhab, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, other fadail must be earned. They're acquired. Imam al-Ghazali says at the end of the day, everything is wahhabi, everything is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, anyway, but there are some virtues that require discipline. And we said last week that uh, Imam Ghazali's theory of vir virtue is very similar to Aristotle in the method of habitus, right? Habituating the lower self to acquire these virtues. But the gaya, the telos, the end is very different for Aristotle in the Nicomachean Ethics. The telos is eudaimonia, a full, um, fulfilled life or happiness or a life of contemplation to become a philosopher. Whereas for Ghazali, it's wilaya, proximity to the divine, sainthood, friendship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now in the preface he says, if someone has been blessed with even one or two of these qualities of perfection and nobility, whether of lineage, beauty, power, knowledge, forbearance, courage, or generosity, he is considered noteworthy and people use him as an example, as a moral exemplar. People's heartfelt esteem of these qualities makes people uh, who have them honored long after their bones have turned to dust. So Imam al-Ghazali um, in his uh, Ihya, um, he mentions or he affirms what are known as the four cardinal virtues, the four principal virtues. He calls them Ummahatul Fadail. And these are courage and wisdom and temperance um, and justice. So they are in Arabic, they are Shaja'a which is epitomized by Abu Bakr Siddiq. So each of the four caliphs epitomizes one of these virtues. Shaja'a, courage, and then Umar, adala, justice. Uthman is ifa, temperance. And hikmah, Sayyidina Ali. These are the ummahatul fadail, the cardinal virtues, the principal virtues. But these also must be refined, according to Imam al-Ghazali, that True virtue is in the middle. It's the mean, the golden mean. So true courage, right? So in other words, courage, it has two extremes, right? So the virtue is in the middle. To one extreme to, is, is, is excessive courage, right? This is ifrat. There's ifrat and tafrit. Too much courage, excessive courage. This is not considered a, a fadl. It's not considered a virtue. It's a vice. So someone, for example, who's has a uh, tahawur or foolhardiness, someone who's reckless, that's not courage. So for example, um, you see somebody, somebody um, mugging someone with a gun on the street. Uh, it's probably not a good idea to confront that person directly because you're going to put yourself in danger. So it's, it's probably a, a better decision to just call the police with your cell phone. And actually approaching that person and trying to stop the mugger is actually not co considered courage, but rather recklessness, and that's a vice. And then you have the other extreme, uh, where there's deficiency in courage, right? Tafrit, and that's cowardice, jubun, right? Even with wisdom, right? So, so the point here is that, that a, a true uh, virtue is to know when and how to act. That's a true virtue, when and how to act. And then to follow a moral exemplar. So as we said, each of the four caliphs epitomized one of these virtues. And the Prophet wasallam epitomizes uh, all of them. But even with wisdom, there are excesses. Excess wisdom is called makar or uh, deceit, tricksterism. right? And in many cultures around the world, Tricksterism is actually lauded, it's praised. If you can, you know, if you can fool someone and get away with it and somehow get their money or something, then you're a clever person, you know, uh, this type of thing. Uh, unfortunately, this is something that's found in cultures all around the world and in literature all around the world, the trickster archetype. Right? It's found in the Bible, it's found in... Uh, in you know, Greek mythology, Prometheus, 
and uh, other places as well. And then obviously, a deficiency of wisdom is called bala or stupidity. Right. So these are the these are the cardinal virtues. And Ghazali also talks about the mystical virtues. So these are cardinal virtues, and then there are mystical virtues. And these mystical virtues, he considers to, them to be these stations that are bestowed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, these maqamat. And the first one is repentance, is tawbah. That's the first station. That's the first station of the spiritual path. And the last one is mahabba, is love. So then along the path, there's sabr and shukr and khawf and zuhud, these 19 mystical virtues. Okay. So Qadi Iyad, he continues. So what can be said of the inestimable worth of someone who possesses all these qualities? Is the microphone working? Yeah. He doesn't like me. Bismillah. So he's saying here, it would be impossible for him to have granted them either by graft or guile. Such a person is only, such a thing is only possible by the gift of Allah the Almighty. So now he's going to list the, the, the various qualities, praiseworthy, praiseworthy qualities, and virtues of the Prophet So prophethood, bearing the message, close friendship with Allah, his love being chosen, the night journey, vision of him, nearness, proximity, revelation, intercession, mediation, all the virtues, high degree, the praiseworthy station, the buraq, the ascension, being sent to all mankind, it's a very long list, leading the prophets in prayer, the witnessing for him of the prophets and their communities, mastery over the descendants of Adam, his being the bearer of, uh, the bearer of the banner of praise, bringing good news and warning, his place with the one with the throne, obedience, bearing the trust, guidance, being a mercy for the worlds, so Allah's being pleased with him so that he is allowed to ask of him, kawthar, being listened to or being obeyed, uh, the perfection of blessing on him, Pardon for past and future wrong actions, the expanding of the breast, the removing of his burden, the elevation of his renown, his being helped by a mighty victory, the sending down of the Sakina, support by the angels, his bringing the book in wisdom and the seven Mathani and the immense Quran, his community being purified, his calling to Allah, the, the prayer of Allah and his angels on him, his judging between people and, and by what Allah showed him, his removing the chains and burden up, uh, from them, Allah swearing by his name, his supplication being answered, inanimate objects and animals speaking to him, the dead being brought to life for his sake, the deaf hearing, water gushing from between his fingers, his turning a little into a lot, the splitting of the moon, the sun going back, his changing of the essence of things, and here's a footnote, for instance, at the Battle of Badr, there was a companion named Ukasha, whose sword had broken, and the Prophet ﷺ picked up a piece of wood and said, take this and fight with it. And then Ukasha looked and it turned into a blade, and they called it al aun So changing the essence of things. He's being helped by terror. This is a bad translation. Terror is a very loaded <laughs> term nowadays. This does not mean terrorism as we know it, astaghfirullah. This means, and this is from the khasa'is of the Prophet ﷺ, that Allah would strike an intense fear and dread into the hearts of his enemies uh, during the military expeditions. Right? سَنُلْقِي فِي قُلُوبِ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا رُعْبَ بِمَا أَشْرَكُوا بِاللَّهِ مَا لَمْ يُنَزِّلْ بِهِ سُلْطَانَ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala struck the hearts of the unbelievers or the mushrikeen with رُعْبَ which is sometimes translated as, as terror. I wouldn't use that translation anymore. I mean, that's what it means, but terror again is a very, very loaded term. This verse is actually from Surah number 3, verse 151, which does have a sabab nuzul according to the ulama. It was revealed for a specific purpose. Uh, Imam At-Tabri, Imam Qurtubi mentioned that after the Battle of Badr, when the Sahaba had suffered many casualties, 
um, and they went back to Medina. The Mushrikeen felt emboldened initially, and they planned on going into Medina itself and then massacring everyone in Medina. Uh, but then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put this intense ru'b, this intense dread, fear into their hearts, and they said, that's good enough. Let's just go back to Mecca. <clears throat> so that's the context of the ayah. And many times the Prophet ﷺ would dress and they'd go out for an expedition, a military engagement, and the enemy would come near him and they would flee. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would put this intense fear and dread in their hearts. He continues listing the Prophet ﷺ's uh, qualities and praiseworthy uh, station. His, his knowing the unseen, the cloud shading him, the glorification of the pebbles, his removing pain, his protection from people, and so on. And this is just some of what Allah gave him. There is much more, he says. Knowledge of his qualities can only be contained by someone who has given it, and only Allah can bestow it. There is no God but him. Add to this all the stations of honor, degrees of purity, ranks of happiness, excellence, and increase which Allah has prepared for him in the domain of al-akhirah, which cannot be numbered, which intellects are unable to grasp, and which confound the imagination. So that's his preface. And now he begins section two with his physical attributes. So this is part of the aqidah of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah to believe that the Prophet ﷺ had the best khuluq and the best khalq. In other words, internal and external beauty. So here we're talking about ethics and physical appearance. And from the prophetic invocations, of course, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he would look into the mirror, Allahumma kama, uh, kama hassanta khalki fa hassan khuluki. Oh Allah, just as you have made my uh, external reality beautiful, beautify my internal reality. It's a beautiful dua. So he, he begins here, Qadi Iyad, he says, there's absolutely no way to conceal the fact that the Prophet is the worthiest of all mankind, the greatest of them in position, and most perfect of them in good qualities and virtue. I am setting out to detail his qualities of perfection in the best way I can, which has filled me with longing to call attention to some of his attributes. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, may Allah grant him peace. No, may Allah illuminate your, my heart and yours and increase my love and your love for this noble prophet. I mean, that if you were to look into all those qualities of perfection, which cannot be acquired um, and which are part of one's constitution, you will find that the prophet has every one of them all of the various good qualities without there being any dispute about it among the transmitters of the, trans, uh, of the tr traditions. The beauty of his form and the perfect proportion of his limbs are related in numerous sound and famous traditions. And then he names a bunch of uh, tr transmitters. Ali and An Anas ibn Malik and Abu Huraira and Al-Bara ibn Azib and Aisha ibn Abi Hala, etc. We'll go into many of these inshallah ta'ala. Some of these are very well known, some of them are not very well known. He had the most radiant coloring, deep black eyes, which were wide set and had a sort of red tint to them, long eyelashes, a bright complexion, and an aquiline nose. Aquiline means it was a slightly hooked nose. Aquila in Latin means eagle, right? It's like eagle's beak. Um, it's also called a Roman nose. In early Christianity, the eagle was a symbol of strength and nobility. The symbol of the Gospel of John was an eagle. The Roman Empire's uh, symbol was the eagle. In ancient Greek mythology, Zeus was symbolized by the eagle. So the aquiline nose, aquiline noses are cross-culturally uh, viewed as beautiful and noble. It's an immediate sign of nobility, a physical sign. He continued, he had a gap between his front teeth, it was a small gap. His face was round with a wide brow, uh, and he had a thick beard which reached his chest. His, che uh, his chest and abdomen were of equal size. So his stomach did not protrude, sallallahu alayhi wa He did not have like a, what we call a pot belly, right? And this is something that's important, um, you know, because uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is, is, like I said, physically he's the most beautiful. Therefore, he's going to be the most healthy. Nowadays, you have this thing going around where we're supposed to accept, uh, you know, 
people as they are, even if they're unhealthy, unfortunately. There are people who complain that they have to, they have to buy two seats on an airplane because they're overweight. Well, some people have sort of predispositions to, to weight gain and things like that, so I'm not talking about that. But a lot of this has to do with a lack of self-control, right? And then they turn it into a civil rights issue. It's like, oh, just as you know, black people had to sit in the back of the bus, now I have to pay for two seats on an airplane. No, it's not, it's not the same thing at all, you know? So you know, obesity is, is unattractive because it's unhealthy, and that person is literally dying. So it's, it's not attractive, it just as anorexia is not attractive because that person is literally dying, right? So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his physical constitution avoided both of these extremes. So you can draw a line from his chest down. It was straight. <clears throat> he was broad chested with broad shoulders, large bones, large arms, thick palms and soles, long fingers, fair skin, and fine hair from the chest to the navel. So, you know, he had some mass, you know. So I tell the brothers, you should lift some weights, you know, increase your muscle mass. Um, there are brothers I know that are pushing 30 that can't find wives. and They're good brothers, but I, I don't know if I can have the heart to tell. I mean, they look like they're 110 pounds. You know? And it's not really attractive to women. It's, it's just not beautiful. So the Prophet Sallallahu is, Alaihi is our example. And he had, he had large arms and a broad chest and, you know, he had broad shoulders and because uh, that's the picture of beauty. He was neither tall nor short, but between the two. In spite of that, no tall person who walked with the Prophet seemed taller than him. His hair was neither straight nor curly. When he laughed, uh, when he laughed and his teeth showed, it was like a flash of lightning where they seemed as white as hailstones. When he spoke, it was like light issuing from between his teeth. He had a well-formed neck, neither broad nor fat. He had a compact body, which was not fleshy. <laughs> Al-Bara said, I did not see anyone with a more beautiful lock of hair resting on a red robe than the Messenger of Allah. Abu Huraira said, I have not seen anything more beautiful than the Messenger of Allah. It was as if the sun was shining in his face. When he laughed, it reflected from the wall. There's another hadith that he doesn't mention here from Sahih Muslim, also related by, uh, by uh, Bara, uh, that the Prophet, he said the Prophet was rajulan marbu'an, he was uh, middle, middle height, broad shouldered, uh, his hair hung down to his earlobes. Then he said, alayhi hullatun hamra, and he was wearing a red mantle. And then he said, ma ra'aytu shay'an qattu ahsana minhu. I did not see anything more beautiful than him. He doesn't say, I didn't see any bashar, or human being, or any man. Or, uh, he said, I, I didn't see anything. Shay'an, nothing in creation was more beautiful than him. Jabir ibn Samura was asked, what, uh, was his face like a sword? He replied, no, it was like the sun and the moon. It was round. That hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. In her description, Umm Ma'bad. Umm Ma'bad is a Atika bintu Khalid. Um, so this is uh, the context of this hadith, and this hadith is in Bayhaqi. That the Prophet Sallallahu when he was making hijrah with Abu Bakr Siddiq, uh, they stopped and rested in a town on their way to Medina. And this woman, Umm Ma'bad, who was a very, very old woman, uh, saw him from a distance and then met him up close. And she said, uh, she said, from afar, he was the most beautiful of people, and up close, he was the most handsome. And then, and then she said to her husband, after the prophet had left, uh, you never get tired of looking at him. Right? She was a very, very old woman. Right? So he, the prophet was very striking, or you would say stunningly handsome. Right? And see, people are like that. You just see them, and it stops you, and you forget what you're saying. Ibn Abi Hala said, his face shone like the full moon. At the end of his description, Ali said, anyone who saw him suddenly was filled with awe of him. So there was a heba, there was like this weightiness or gravitas or dignity. People, when they Im immediately saw the Prophet they were awestruck by him, right? Like they were just 
overcome. It's like when, when you first lay eyes on the Kaaba, when you actually see the Kaaba, that first initial moment, you're awestruck by the spectacle. So Sayyidina Ali says this, this hadith is in the Shema al Tirmidhi. And then he says, those who kept his company loved him, but when you actually mixed with him, got to know him, then you, the Heba is still there, but then you started to, to love him almost immediately. And some people are like this also. You meet a perfect stranger, and there's something about their attitude that you, after two minutes, you think, I love this guy. He's such a nice guy. Mashallah, he's a beautiful guy. All who describe him say that they have not seen anyone like him, either before or since. I did not see before or after the likes of him. There are many famous hadiths, so Qadi Iyadi, he concludes the section here. There are many famous uh, hadith which describe him. We will not take time here to give all of them. We have restricted ourselves to some aspects of his description and given a summary of them, which is enough to serve our purpose. Um, section three is on his cleanliness. His cleanliness. So he begins here by saying, the complete cleanliness of his body, the sweetness of his smell and perspiration, and his freedom from uncleanliness and bodily defects comprise a special quality given to him by Allah, which no one else enjoys. And these were made yet more complete by the cleanliness dictated by the Sharia uh, and the 10 practices of natural behavior. So these are called the Asharatun min al Fitra. There's a hadith in Sahih Muslim that names these these basically 10 practices of good hygiene, right? There, elsewhere in, in other hadith, they're called asharatun min sunnah the 10 practices of the, of the Prophet وسلم, of the sunnah. So the hadith, in Mus and there's different versions of the hadith, but in Muslim from Aisha, clipping the mustache, obviously this refers only to the men, not allowing the mustache to go into the mouth. It's considered very bad hygiene. Letting the beard grow, the beard is a sign of uh, rujulia, virility, manliness, um, prestige, maturity, power. It's proper for a man to have even a few hairs uh, on his chin. It shouldn't be out of control and untidy. Using a toothpick or a toothbrush, a very good hygienic practice of the Prophet وسلم, snuffing up water into the nose or rinsing the nose out. Very good uh, practice for health reasons. Cutting the nails, obviously, good hygiene. Washing the knuckles by here, the hands or the, the joints, right? Which is what we're told to do a lot nowadays. Do fist bumps now, we're not allowed to shake hands anymore. Because of corona stuff. Plucking the, uh, or, or trimming the hair of the armpit. Shaving or, or pl uh, plucking or trimming the pubic hair cleansing oneself with water uh, in the lavatory. A lot of people don't do that, by the way, which is very strange to think about that, but a lot of people don't do that. Using water after you use the bathroom. A very good hygienic practice. It's axiomatic for us, but a lot of people don't do that. The narrator forgot the tenth, but he said it could be rinsing out the mouth. It's a good practice. It's like a form of a quick floss. When you eat, just rinse the mouth out. Any food particles will come out. Sometimes they get stuck and they cause infection. And then one version has circumcision rather than letting the beard grow. So different versions of the hadith. Uh, but these are the 10 practices of the fitrah or the 10 practices of the sunnah, the 10 practices of good hygiene and, and healthy, uh, healthy living. The Messenger of Allah said, the deen is based on cleanliness. So, he quotes this hadith, the commentator says, it's from Ibn Hibban, and it's da'if, but there's a hadith in Muslim. At-tuhuru shatrul iman. This is in Sahih Muslim. Cleanliness is half of faith. In this culture, they say, cleanliness is next to godliness. <clears throat> and I said that I have not smelled amber, musk, or anything more fragrant than the smell of a messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Hadith is in Muslim and Tirmidhi. Jabir ibn Samura said that the Messenger of Allah touched his cheek. So the Prophet Sallam, he would pass by groups of children playing, and oftentimes he just kind of pat them on the head. Sometimes he'd pat them like on the cheek like this. So this happened to, to, uh, to Jabir. He said the Prophet 
touched my cheek and he said, I felt a cool sensation uh, and his hand was scented. And he said, It was like he drew his hand out of a bag of perfume. That's what it smelled like when he touched my cheek. This incredible, there's a coolness to it and this incredible smell to it. Someone said, um, no, ma uh, no matter whether he had put scent on his hand or not, if he shook a man's hand, the fragrance would remain for the whole day. One of my teachers said, Allahu Alam, he said that after the Isra wal Mi'raj, the scent increased. It was a natural scent he had since birth, but it got more intense after the Laylatul Isra wal Mi'raj. If the Prophet placed his hand on the head of a child, that child would be recognized among other children by the fragrance. You smell his head, right? And then, you know, there were, in the time of the Tabi'een, some of the Sahaba, you know, that were still alive, were very old. And the Tabi'een would actually line up at their doors just to, like, see, like, the man's head. Because they said the Prophet's hand once touched his, when he was a boy. Now he's an old man, he's gray or he's bald. And they go and they smell his head. <laughs> they say, I can still smell the fragrance of the Prophet. So, no. <laughs> the Messenger of Allah slept on a rug in a house of Anas and perspired. Anas's mother, Umm Sulaim, brought a long-necked bottle in which to put his araq, his sweat. When the messenger asked her about this, she said, we put it in our perfume, huwa min atyabitib. She said, it is the most fragrant of scents, the best of perfumes, Bukhari and Muslim. In this great history, Al-Bukhari mentioned that Jabir said, when the Prophet went down a road, anyone who followed him, um, Anyone who followed him knew he had passed that way because of his scent. So the Prophet went through like a, a path in the streets. You can just follow his fragrance and, and know exactly where he went if he had a good sense of smell. And then he says here, Ishaq ibn, ibn Rahawe mentioned that the Prophet's fragrance occurred without the use of perfume. I don't know who Ishaq ibn Rahawe, Rahawe is. That's something that he mentions here from one of the scholars, even without the use of perfume. It's a natural scent he had. Muhammad ibn Sa'd uh, al waqid scribe related that Aisha said uh, to the Prophet وسلم, when you come from relieving yourself, we do not see anything noxious from you. He said, Aisha, don't you know that the earth swallows up what comes out of the prophets so that none of it is seen? So he quotes this hadith. This hadith is very much disputed, though. It's very much disputed. But he does mention it here. Connected to this, we have a hadith of Sayyidina Ali. I washed the Prophet's body, so this is after the Prophet had passed, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and I began to look for what is normally found in a corpse. But I did not find anything. And then I said, he's speaking to the Prophet, Bi Abi, he said, by may, so may my father be ransomed. At-tayyibu tibta hayyan. Sayyidina Ali is saying this to the Prophet وسلم, as he's washing him, that you were pure in life and pure in death. He added, a sweet smell came from him, whose like I have never experienced. There's in multiple hadith, and, but some of the ulama say there may be some weakness in this. Ibn Majah related to Abu Dawud al-Hakim and others. In Bukhari, Abu Bakr kissed the Prophet وسلم, after the latter's death, and he said something to the same effect. It was also the time when Malik ibn Sinan drank some of the blood of the Prophet وسلم, at Ghaswat Uhud. He says he licked it up. The Prophet allowed him to do that and then said, the fire will not touch you. This hadith is in a Tabarani. Um, this hadith is often attacked by like Christian polemicists. So something to remember about this hadith is this, this was not a command. The Prophet did not command. Um, Malik to do this. This was a spur of the moment thing that Malik did and it was, it was out of love for the Prophet The Prophet did not command him, but he allowed him and he excused him for doing that. Um, it's interesting that Christians would attack this. Christian apologists attack this hadith. There's a statement from Isa Islam in their source. It's a very strange statement that they attribute to him and the Gospel of John chapter 6 where he says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, there is no life in you. And Catholics actually take that quite literally. 
this is a command. So one of their seven sacraments is called the Eucharist, where they come together on Sunday for the Mass, and they have bread and they have wine, and something occurs during the process called transubstantiation, which they actually believe that the Holy Spirit will change the essence of the bread into the literal body of God, and then they eat it, and then the wine into the literal blood of God, and then they drink that, right? So this is something that they're commanded to do. Right? So it's very ironic that they attack hadith like this because a companion on the day of Uhud, you know, in that intense situation where the prophet is bleeding, right, that this companion basically jumped on the prophet and, and took some of the blood into his mouth uh, out of love. Um, but nowadays, because of the corona thing, because so when you go into a Catholic church, the priest is supposed to take this a wafer, he's supposed to put it right on the tongue. But now the Vatican is saying that's that's not optimal because of the coronavirus, right? That's how germs get passed. So you're supposed to put the wafer in the person's hand. But then there are crumbs that come off. And those crumbs, if they're discernible with the eye as being wafer, then that's literally, literally, it's not figurative. The Protestants say figurative. The Catholics are over a billion and a half. And they say it's literal. That's literally the body of God. So then you have people wiping, you know, their hands on their pants and things like that. And, so, it's causing a lot of problems with, uh, with Catholics right now. Um, this one's also something that's always, always attacked here. Something similar is related that when a woman drank some of his urine and he told her, you will never complain of a stomach ache. So the hadith is in Al-Hakim. Um, and then Qadi Iyad says, he did not order any of them to wash their mouths out, nor did he forbid them from doing it again. <clears throat> then he says, the hadith of the woman drinking the urine is sound. Uh, uh, ad um follows Muslim and Bukhari, who relate it in the Sahih. Uh, I couldn't locate this hadith in Bukhari and Muslim. Uh, then I called one of my colleagues, who is a hadith scholar, and he said it's not in it's not in Bukhari and Muslim, so I don't know what's happening here. Maybe this is a a bad translation, or Qadi Iyad is, just seems to be mistaken here. Uh, the hadith is found in a Tabarani, uh, he, but nonetheless, Qadi Iyad goes on to say the name of this woman was Baraka, and they disagree about her lineage. Some say that it was Um Ayman who used to serve the Prophet Sallam. She said that the messenger had a wooden cup which he placed under his bed in which he would uh, urinate in, uh, during the night. One night he urinated in it, and when examined, when he examined it in the morning, there was nothing left in it. He asked Baraka about that, and she said, I got up and I was thirsty, so I drank it without knowing. It was unintentional. And then he says this hadith is related by Ibn Juraj and others. So this, like I said, this hadith is in Tabarani, and most muhaddithin consider it very, very weak. Now, many of those ulama do maintain, however, that the entire body of the Prophet وسلم, is tahir. His entire body is pure. All right, so the question is about this hadith. Um, so his physical body is, is special, and that's from his khasais. However, there's no, even on this issue, there's no ijma. Right? And many other ulama maintain that all human um, uh, excrement is najis, and this is true of all the prophets because they're still human beings. So Allahu Alam. <clears throat> Qadi Iyad also mentions the prophet was born circumcised with his umbilical cord cut. It is related that his mother Amina said he was born clean and there's no impurity on and there was no impurity on him. Hello.
<clears throat> what time do we pray, Isha, here? Nine o'clock, okay. So I don't have much else to say, so we'll finish. That's the end of section three, and then we'll do section four, inshallah. And then we'll call it a night, inshallah. So section four, his intellect, eloquence, and the acuteness of his faculties. Any questions so far or comments? Or? Section 4, Chapter 2. As for his ample intellect, intelligence, and acuteness of his senses, his eloquence, the grace of his movements, and excellence of his faculties, there is no doubt that he was the most intelligent and astute of people. Anyone who reflects on how he managed the inward and outward affairs of people and the politics of the common people and the elite and his amazing qualities and wonderful life, not to mention the knowledge which flowed from him and the way he confirmed the Sharia without any previous instruction, experience or reading any books will have no doubts about the superiority of his intellect and the firmness of his understanding. None of this requires confirmation because it has already been amply verified. So you think about like all of the different hats as it were that the Prophet ﷺ wore during his life as being a father, um, as being the head of state, uh, as being um, a prophet, uh, all of these different things that he was doing as being a military commander as being a spiritual leader um, is really incredible and remarkable, right? Which has led many, as we know, Western scholars to conclude that really he's in a class by himself. There's no one quite like him in all of history, right? What is the famous book by Michael Hart, 1978, <coughs> The 100 Most Influential People, ranking the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam number one because no, nobody had the, the holistic impact that he had in, in all of history, really, when you think about it. Not even close, I think. I mean, second place is very, very distant. Mujahid said, when the, Prophet, when the Messenger of Allah sallam, got up for prayer, uh, he could see all those behind him as if they were in front of him. And this is established in strong hadith in Bukhari. أَقِيمُ السُّفُوفِ فَإِنِّي أَرَاكُمْ خَلْفَ ظَهْرِي So he said, um, establish the, the lines for prayer, stand straight, for indeed I can see behind my back. <laughs> this affords one commentary on the words, وَتَقَلُّبَكَ فِي السَّاجِدِينَ So here Qadi Iyadi quotes this verse, we, he quoted it earlier, uh, and we quoted it earlier as well. Ibn Abbas's opinion about this, and you're turning about in those who make sajda. Ibn Abbas's opinion is that this is a reference to the prophetic light that is being passed through uh, Salihin, uh, from Adam alayhi salam to Nuh alayhi salam to Ibrahim alayhi salam, all the way to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, that the prophetic light was being passed. This is one of the proofs that are used uh, to indicate that there's no shirk in the immediate ancestry, uh, in the direct ancestry of the Prophet Wasallam. But here he's, he's quoting it for a different reason. He's saying here, taqallub, wa taqallubaka fi sajideen. Taqallub refers to his eyesight, right? And your, um, a, in your ability to see those who are makes, making sajda from behind his back. And this is supported by another ayah in the Quran. Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 144, sama, That indeed we see you turning your face towards the sky or directing your eyes. Taqallub here, wajhika. Taqalluba wajhika means to, to, to turn your eyes towards the heavens. Right? So some of the ulama say that this ayah in Ash-Shu'ara, verse 219, uh, indicates the 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 eyesight of the Prophet ﷺ and his ability to see behind him during the prayer. The Muwatta contains the words of the Prophet, I can, and there's other hadith he quotes here, I can see you behind me. There is something similar from Anas in the two Sahih collections. Aisha said the same thing, adding from herself, it is something extra which Allah gave him as an additional proof. One of the variants has, I can see whoever is behind me as I see whoever is in front of me. Another has, I see the one behind my neck as I see the one before me. <clears throat> then Baqir ibn Mukhalad related that Aisha said the Prophet ﷺ could see as well in the dark as he saw in the light. This hadith is in Bukhari. 
<clears throat> uh, sorry, Ibn Haqi mentions this hadith. And there may, may be some weakness in the Isnad. There are many other sound traditions about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam seeing the angels. These are sound traditions. He saw Jibreel Alayhi Salam, 600 wings uh, on a throne between the heavens and the earth across the horizon. He saw the shayateen in, in sound traditions. Um, he was able to see the Najashi in Al-Habasha, uh, the Christian king who had become Muslim, by the way. But he's not, a, he's not considered a Sahabi because he did not see with his eyes the Prophet ﷺ. But he's a Tabi'i. He's a Tabi'i who lived at the time with the Prophet ﷺ. <laughs> so uh, he could pray for him. So the, on the day that the Najashi died, um, the Prophet ﷺ, he said, مَا تَلْيَوْمْ رَجْلٌ صَالِحٌ فَقُومُ فَصَلُّوا أَنْ أَخِيكُمْ أَسْحَمَا That was his name the king of Abyssinia. So he said, today a righteous man has died. So he was informed of this by uh, Jibril alayhi salam. So stand and pray for your brother. Right. <clears throat> In the same way, he says, he saw Jerusalem after his night journey. So he was given some sort of ru'ya vision, an awakened state of the temple precincts in Jerusalem, temple mount area. Uh, because some of the Quraysh had gone there on caravans and they knew the description. So they said, well, why don't you describe it so, so we can confirm that you were there. So even though he was there, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala manifested like it was right in front of him, like the Kaaba is right in front of him. He was able to pinpoint these, describe these minute details. And there's some other traditions that say that, that they still didn't believe him. And then he said, okay, you know, in a few days, a caravan will arrive. There's one camel missing. I saw it bolt away from them. Then the, the caravan arrived. Allahu Alam. Um, he also saw the Kaaba when he was building the mosque in Medina. So this ex extraordinary ability to see things, to hear things, right? Ahmed ibn Muhammad and others related that the Prophet could see eleven stars in the Pleiades, Thurayya. This, according to Ahmed ibn Muhammad and others, refers to the total, which is uh, which it is physically possible to see with the naked eye. One of them believed that this referred to his knowing about it. However, the clear meaning contradicts this, and there is no impossibility of this having been done. Clear-sightedness is one of the special traits of the Prophet ﷺ and one of their qualities. Abu Huraira said that the Prophet said, when Allah the Mighty manifested himself to Musa, he was able to see an ant on a stone in the darkness of the night at a distance of 10 leagues. This is in Tabarani. Therefore, it is in no way impossible for a prophet to have been able to do what he had, we have mentioned in this chapter after the night journey and the favor he received on seeing one of the greatest signs of his Lord. Traditions have come down to the effect that he threw down Rukana, the strongest of the people of his time, and called him to Islam. So the famous uh, Meccan wrestler who was, you know, he was, he was the best wrestler, right? And he was a big, huge guy. And, and the prophet says, Salam, he basically just kind of body slammed him a couple of times. He did the first time, Rukana said, how did you do that? No one's ever done it. He said, let me show you, he did it again. And then he became Muslim. So it's physical strength. <clears throat> and then Abu Huraira said, I did not see anyone who walked more swiftly than the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It was, as if, it was as if the earth rolled up for him. We would exhaust ourselves and yet he was not tired at all. And this hadith also mentioned something similar in the Shema'il of Imam Tirmidhi. Another of his qualities was that his laugh was only a smile. When he turned to face someone, he turned to face them directly or totally. He would turn his entire body towards that person. Um, so he wouldn't turn like this and speak to someone. He was considered, he would consider that sort of bad adab. He would turn completely. And when he walked, he walked as if, and then he would turn, when he was done, he would turn completely away. Uh, and when he walked, he, he walked as if he, as if he was coming down a slope. So he would walk, in other words, he would walk with intention. He'd walk as if he had somewhere to go. He just, wasn't just walking around, meandering around, looked like he had nothing to do. And you know, So the Sahaba would have a hard time keeping up with him. And it's also due to his perfect physical constitution, again, perfect physical health, right, that he, he had just this vigor and strength about him. So his walk was naturally fast. So that's the 
end of section four. So that's all I had planned on doing for today, inshallah. So we'll leave a little bit early unless we have some, some questions or comments. So next time I'm planning on, inshallah, getting to section seven or eight. Inshallah. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.